Thank you very much, Dr. Earhart. Thank you all for being here today and for giving me the opportunity to be here to talk with you about the Dog Aging Project. Um, as usual, my, my opinions are mine alone and not those of Nestle Purina, and I have no other conflicts of interest to declare. So what I'm gonna talk with you about today is the Dog Aging Project, the state of our science. And what I hope will happen by the end of this conversation is that I will have inspired you to use our data. So one of our major objectives is to be an open data resource for the scientific community as well as the general public. And so what I plan to share with you today is an overview of who we are and what we do and how we do it so that you will be confident to approach our data and take it in hand and use it for yourselves. We also welcome collaboration, of course, but even more powerful is the ability that you have to answer your own scientific questions with data that we've collected. So I will spend time talking about the design and structure of the project, the community science nature of our project and how that interacts with our open data promise. And then I'll share a, a bit of a smattering of recent publications, uh, recent unpublished work and findings to try to get you to understand the scope of what's possible. And, and this is truly just the beginning of what I believe we can do with this project. So as Nicole has laid out for us in the previous session, the Jera Science Research Hypothesis aims to answer the question of why we age. And if we think about any phenotype represented here by P, in this case, the aging phenotype, any phenotype results from the combination of the genetic background, the environmental or exposure history of the individual, and the interaction between the two. And so within the Jera science question, we're interested in looking at how the biologic background of an individual plus the experiences of its life form together this collective phenotype of its aging trajectory. And we know from our own experience and from the research that's been presented already today that some individuals age faster than others, right? As veterinary clinicians, we know this. We can have someone bring us a patient and you say, oh, how old is your dog? And they say, oh, he's, he's 10. You're like, wow, he looks terrific. 410, right? You have an idea of what 10 should look like and this dog looks terrific. And someone else can bring you a dog and say, oh, how old's your dog? And they say he's eight and you're like, oh. <laughs> not going quite so well. So we have this observation of a differing aging phenotype, and we're interested in understanding why it is that some individuals age faster than others. If we can understand that, it creates the opportunity to improve the healthing trajectory for all of us. Again, in my case, thinking of dogs, but of course this is a translational model that should apply to people and beyond. Shown here is the kind of black box of this Jera science hypothesis. So somehow genes and environment go in at the top, modified by the chronological age, which as we heard in the previous session, is not a perfect predictor of the aging trajectory. And then the endophenotypes, or those molecular mechanisms by which the aging experience unfolds, kicking out at the bottom of the box the experience of that individual over time. So, in response to the tenets of the Jera Science Research Hypothesis, the Dog Aging Project is a large-scale, long-term, longitudinal study of companion dogs, importantly, companion dogs, in the U.S., with apologies to the international audience here, you cannot all enroll your dog, your dog must live in the U.S., you can actually live wherever you care to, but your dog must live in the U.S., um, and we have the goals of discovering the genetic and environmental determinants of healthy aging and identifying strategies to extend that. There are some key components and values of the project that will be part of what I explained today. So we are a community science initiative, and we deeply honor the human-animal bond that our participants share with their dogs. We are an open data project, as I've alluded to. We intend to create a public resource for the general public and education, but also for the research community. And we have a robust shareable infrastructure. It is our hope that the infrastructure that we've built becomes a pipeline on which ancillary studies can be launched. And a culture of collaboration with colleagues within the project, colleagues across the country, and colleagues outside the project who, after collaborating with them, we hope will join the project. So I'll share a little bit of how our design and structure influences the kind of data that is available. 
first, we are structured as a, um, an NIH U19, which basically is a multidisciplinary research program that's intended to create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And so we are built as infrastructure cores and hypothesis-driven projects. And so within each of the units shown here, we have cores that manage the needs of the project and then projects that pursue the science. Uh, I am deeply involved with Core C, which is our recruitment and retention core. This is where we identify and engage the participant dog owners. And also with Project 1, which is the clinical aging phenotype. Our other research components are a genetic project in Project 2, the multi-omics systems biology project of Project 3, and that what some of you might have heard about, Triad, which is the test of rapamycin in aging dogs. So a clinical trial of sub-immunosuppressive rapamycin in middle-aged to older dogs looking for actual lifespan extension as the primary outcome. So this is complicated, and I'm going to walk you through this diagram. And it's not important to me that you actually understand all of the intricate uh, inner workings of this project, but it is my hope to help you understand where the data are coming from so that you can figure out how they apply to your own research goals. So we start with the dog owners. So Coursey interacts with social media and direct outreach, working through um, clubs and professional organizations trying to get visibility to, in, to arrange for owners to sign up their dogs. And from that place, we also send survey instruments or instructions for at-home tasks, as well as kits that enable these dog owners to collect specimens from their dogs with limited help from um, medical infrastructure. We're also collecting a lot of information about the dog's environments, and much of this is survey or questionnaire based, but some of it includes direct sampling of non-municipal water sources in some cases, as well as direct measurement of dog activity through actigraphy monitors on the collar, and also direct measurement of exposure to toxins in the environment through adsorbent silicone tags that can be worn on the collar of a dog. All of the data flows to our data core, which is core B, and we also bring in externally available public data about environment that is mapped to each dog's home location. So that data is brought in and, and combined with the rest of the information we have about that dog. I mentioned that we interact somewhat with uh, private practice veterinarians, and so in that sense, we have dog owners in some cohorts receive biospecimen kits, which they take to their family veterinarian for collection, and we also have the clinical trial unfolding at a number of cardiology and neurology specialty practices, both private practices and academic practices in the US. Owners in some cohorts collect DNA samples from their dogs at home, which are submitted to us for analysis, and again, owners take their dog's uh, biospecimen kits to their veterinarians to have those collected. And samples are sent back to Texas A&M, so we start by sending all biospecimens to the Texas Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab, TMV TVMDL, and after routine clinical pathology processing, those samples are handed off to my lab uh, at Texas A&M for further processing and then downstream shipping to the rest of our partner labs. This includes working with the Cornell Veterinary Biobank, which is our core E, so that samples from these dogs are biobanked for distribution to the research community so that the samples are directly available to you. And all of this with our open data promise is a cloud-based data resource. And so our participants interact with us significantly online and our data are available online. Within the project, we have several nested cohorts. Our largest cohort is the PAC, and a PAC member is any dog whose owner has completed our baseline survey instrument. That's it. If they've done that one time, we consider them a member of the PAC forever, and we return to them again and again with additional requests for further surveys, updates to that fundamental instrument, or activities that they can complete with their dog at home. Within that group, we select 10,000 dogs who will be genotyped. We're at about 80, 7,900 at this time who have been selected into this group. And another group that is selected for um, genetic analysis consists specifically of dogs whose owners have not been able to share their dog's medical record. We are collecting veterinary electronic medical records as often as we can, but we recognize that that 
stratifies our population and creates a bias for those folks who are capable of doing that versus those folks who are not. And so we intentionally are including a group of dogs whose owners have not been able to complete that step as part of our targets for genomic analysis. The precision cohort is one that I think is the most interesting to clinicians because this is 1,000 dogs who have done all the surveys, submitted their medical records, and these are the dogs who receive the biospecimen kit. So 1,000 dogs annually receive that kit. These are also the dogs, a subset of whom have um, the actigraphy monitors and the silicone tags for toxin exposure, as well as non-municipal water source sample collection. And then the test of rapamycin in aging dogs, or the triad trial, which I will not speak about much today, but this is an ongoing placebo-controlled double-blinded trial of sub-immunosuppressive rapamycin in large middle-aged dogs. And finally, the centenarian cohort. This is the only cohort that is not exclusively selected from our PAC members. Our intent here is to recruit dogs who are the equivalent of human centenarians, that is, that they have survived already to the top 1% of expected lifespan for their size. And because we know that this will be a unique and difficult to recruit group, we are not requiring that those owners are members of our PAC first, but we are doing some direct recruitment through veterinarians. Obviously, this is a big project, and I am very, very fortunate to be part of a big team. So this is about two-thirds of the team at our annual meeting in Seattle um, last September. And I share this, um, this image just to reiterate that we have deep and broad expertise ranging from veterinary clinical practice, which is where I come from, to social media experts, to experts in every um, biology background that you can think of. We have a pediatric ethicist on the team. Um, and we have a tremendous wealth of resources to support both the participating dog owners and also our research collaborators. So that's a little bit about who we are and how we operate. Let me share with you a bit more about community science and our open data promise. So community science is a collaboration between scientists and the general public. And I think it's really important to remember that it's a collaboration. Oftentimes we think of community science as simply a different way that we get data. And that is true. But when we are working with volunteers who participate in our research for the good of the public or their own personal interest, we really need to view them as equal partners. Companion dogs have highly individualized lifestyles, as Dr. Earhart alluded to earlier. This is partly why they are such terrific translational models for human health in a way that can't be replicated by most laboratory species because they are exposed to varied diets and physical activity and geography and altitude and travel history and risk in a way that's just not possible to, to replicate in a lab. Because their lifestyles are so unique, the only person who can tell you what is happening in that dog's life is that dog's owner. And we must get that information from their owners. Their owners love their dogs, right? My career depends upon it, as does many of yours. And so the fact that owners love their dogs motivates them strongly to share data within a community, a community science um, arrangement. But it also means that they expect some return on their investment. They want back the data, not only from their individual dog, but from what we have learned about bettering the lives of dogs in general. And that is a high bar that we strive to we strive to meet, we strive to clear, sometimes we just meet. Um, and there are, there are specific advantages to working with a community science population. Again, as I've alluded to, a diversity of settings, a diversity of people who can participate, a diversity of dogs who participate. For me, another value of the community science approach is that these are, quote unquote, typical dogs experiencing typical health. As a veterinary specialist practicing in a tertiary care facility, I don't see typical dogs. Most of the research that I would have access to in my practice are not typical dogs. They're the sickest of the sick, the weirdest of the weird, owned by people with disposable income, right? And that's not typical. So for me, one of the values of the community science approach is that it gives us access to dogs who are experiencing a much more typical range of the species it also means that if we want our research to be applicable to the average American dog, 
we can't exclusively use data that's not available from the average American dog, and we can't exclusively develop interventions that won't be available to the average American dog. And so thinking about those longer-term objectives influences our design. These owners have a strong intrinsic motivation to participate, and I see that as an opportunity to create <clears throat> educational experiences, as has been mentioned previously, to help people better understand JARA science. It's not without its challenges, though. Um, we have a diversity of settings, people and dogs, which is a good thing for the research data, but it can make some of our interactions challenging. The use of non-professional scientists has the potential to introduce error, and so any type of instruction that is provided, any type of task that is requested, must be very, very carefully designed and double-checked. Uh, research is hard. Research is hard. People get bored with it. People get tired of it. Um, people want the research to fit neatly into their lives. I have a wonderful communications team who handles literally tens of thousands of emails from our participants annually. Um, and things come in from folks that are easy to understand but slightly comical when they happen, like we've asked you to do a particular exercise task with your dog, and we'll get an email that says, but it is raining. And it is raining, and on that day, you probably shouldn't and can't do it. Um, but the other 40,000 people that we asked to do it might not be raining at their house. So we do, have, um, we do have the challenge of helping people understand that while we want to tailor this project to them, we are also presenting these tasks to a large number of people. And again, as I've already mentioned, these participants have legitimately high expectations that our research will be applicable to them and returned to them. Part of community science is often open data, not always, but often the case that community science projects have an open data commitment and return their findings to the public. So I share this with you so that you can um, apply for open data access. Uh, we have a wonderful data coordinator, Mandy Kaufman, who will assist you in that application and you can log in and start using our data as quickly as you complete the process. When you access our data, you'll access it on Terra, which is at the uh, platform at the Broad Institute and MIT, and this is a Google Cloud platform with analytic um, software built in so that you can actually do your analysis in the cloud as well. And if you were to obtain data access and log in, this is what you would see. You would see our curated data releases. So we curate a data release annually. Occasionally, we will update it throughout the year as we discover idiosyncrasies or inaccuracies with the data release as it came out in the first place, and the current available data release will always be what's on Terra. When people publish our data, we ask them to cite very clearly which data release they've used. I will also share that all of our survey instruments that are currently live are publicly available on GitHub, so you could log in there today and see what the survey instruments are. You don't have to be part of our data use agreement to do this. And so when I refer to some of the data that I'm going to share here momentarily and mention some of our survey instruments, this is where you can go see them in their entirety, including all the survey logic. The code books that are available on GitHub also explain errors or idiosyncrasies with how we discover that participants handled a particular question or answered a particular question. Okay, so with a bit of an understanding of our structure and a bit of an understanding of our community scientists and our open data commitment, I'm gonna share just briefly some recent publications and, and ongoing research by our team. So first, we'll look at age-related diseases and their modifiers. We are very interested in the health of these dogs. As a veterinary practitioner, that is my first and foremost interest, is the health of these dogs. And obtaining health data from dogs at this scale is tricky. So we have a number of instruments to document the health of these dogs. The first two that I'll share with you are owner-reported. So our health and life experience survey, referred to as HLES, is that comprehensive survey that all participants complete, upon completion of which they are members of our pack. That is owner-reported information. At the time that they enroll their dog, we ask them a health questionnaire, and we ask, has your dog ever been diagnosed with? So at that first instance, it is a lifetime prevalence document. Annually, we represent that same health survey to the participants, and we say, within the last year has your dog ever been diagnosed with? And so that will enable us over time to accumulate data about the annual incidence of these diseases. When dogs die, we invite their owners to complete what we call our end of life survey, or ELS, 
and they are asked to do this within 40 days of notifying us of the death of their dog. Most owners agree to complete it, but owners are permitted to opt out because we recognize that this is a sensitive subject. We ask them if they would like to complete it, and if they say no, they'd never hear from us about it again. But if they are willing to complete it, we're very grateful for the information. We also try to obtain veterinary medical records and the veterinary medical diagnoses contained therein. This is challenging, as you are all aware. We obtain the records electronically, but of course, everyone uses a different proprietary format. We will not accept exclusively handwritten records because of the burden of extracting data from those, but we will accept electronic records in any format. And then we have a team that manually extracts key variables. Over time, we hope to turn this into a machine learning type algorithm, but we first have to have a validated training set. So we are attempting to confirm that what the owners have told us about their dog's health is what the veterinarians have documented about the dog's health from a concurrent instrument. Additionally, we have a chronic diagnosis inventory that is sent directly to the veterinarian, and this is to help us capture multimorbidity in these aging dogs. And so this includes a forced choice survey for the veterinarian of 16 chronic diagnoses that we believe will be relevant to multimorbidity, where the veterinarian is asked to say the dog has this, has never had this, or I don't know, so that we know when we don't have the information recorded, whether it was because it's definitively not present or because the information was not available to be recorded. And so all of these complementary sources of health information are what we are using to build our understanding of age-related trajectory of disease acquisition in dogs. Asking owners to tell you their dog's health is highly challenging because one choice is give them a free text box and say what's wrong with your dog, and the likelihood of getting comprehensive and correctly spelled information is very poor. Um, on the other hand, you can't just give them a list of every diagnosis that you've ever heard of. Uh, or, well, perhaps you could, but I don't think that it would be very well received. And so what we've done in HLES Health is we present diagnoses categorically. So first, we present all the pathophysiologic processes that are multisystemic. Has your dog ever had an infection? Has your dog ever had cancer? Hoping that people will recognize that comprehensive terminology and report the disease within that category. And after that, we go through organ systems and present the name of the organ system and a number of diagnoses that could exist within that organ system, always including the option for other please describe. Some of the data that I'm going to share with you next focuses on HLES health section at the category level. So when I say we're talking about musculoskeletal diseases, any owner who reported any disease in that category would be part of that analysis. So one of the first, um, research publications I want to share with you. This is Dr. Kirsten Forsyth, who was formerly a fellow with my group and now is at Purdue University, where she is about to begin a cardiology residency. So she used our 2020 curated data release. It was over 27,000 dogs. And again, using that first survey completion, so lifetime prevalence of diagnosis, and there were no exclusions. And the question she asked is, given the top 25 most common breeds in our pack, what are the top 10 conditions that they have at the um, specific diagnosis level? And so, interestingly, the potential existed for there to be 250 diagnoses in that list, but despite the fact that she looked at 10 conditions in each of 25 breeds, it was only 53 conditions that made up that total union set. Um, and some of these are not surprising, some of them might be. Dental calculus was the single most common unique diagnosis reported. I was surprised by the frequency with which owners reported dog bites. And I was interested in the fact that it was not a size-dependent phenomenon. Both little dogs had been bitten and big dogs had been bitten. And then, again, a second representation of dental disease, osteoarthritis, and giardia, more commonly than other parasitism. The question that I ask myself is, do owners recognize that name better than they recognize the name of their puppy's juvenile nematodes, or is it possible that some of these dogs were acquired as adults, and to the owner's knowledge, those juvenile nematodes happened before they acquired that dog? So this is an interesting heat map, and this is part of the manuscript that's been submitted, but it basically um, shows a hierarchical clustering of the breeds of dogs on the bottom and the diagnoses on the right. And what you can see is that there are patterns of similarity between the types of diagnoses seen in breeds. Some of these are relatively obvious, and some of them are breeds that 
I had not thought were particularly similar to one another. So just a very early look at the kinds of large-scale associative analysis that's possible with this cross-sectional data in our first year. Another publication that might um, be familiar to some of you received a lot of interest when it came out. So again, using our 2020 curated data release, Dr. Emily Bray, who's at the University of Arizona, looked at feeding frequency and its association with categorical disease diagnosis. Again, now we're talking specifically about a category. If there were any diagnosis at all in the cardiac category, it was scored as positive. Um, this research group excluded any diagnoses that were implausibly related to diet or were focal or rare, just so that they were looking at disease categories with which they thought they had robust analysis. And they also excluded puppies because puppies' dietary management is probably emerging. And they excluded owners who said, my dog's diet is completely inconsistent. It varies day to day, week to week. So ultimately, they scored that the disease categories were present or absent, any diagnosis in the category. And they assessed feeding categories in two ways. First, they compared once daily feeding against all other types of feeding. And then they also broke it into a four-level ordinal system, once daily, twice daily, three times daily, free fed. The interest in this, of course, comes from the interest in caloric restriction or intermittent fasting as strategies that have been used in research settings to prolong lifespan. And what's not clear is whether it is the timing of the feeding or the total amount of calories that matters most. In this particular assessment, total amount of calories was not available to the researchers based on the data that we had, and so they're looking at timing only. So if you look here at the odds of particular diagnoses being associated or not with once daily feeding, the darkly colored dots are the statistically significant findings, and there are a number of categories of disease that are more commonly seen in those animals who are fed just once daily, a number of other categories where there was no relationship. It's really important to remember this is our first data year, so these are cross-sectional results only. And this was one of the challenges when this manuscript came out, was many of our participants contacting us to say, oh, so I should only feed my dog once daily. But we don't know that from these data. It is at least as likely that dogs who have these diagnoses can be fed once daily, or dogs who lack these diagnoses can be fed once daily, whereas dogs with chronic gastrointestinal disease or for other reasons are fed more often because of their disease rather than the other way around. So important to stress the difference between associative results and causation. This um, figure I find interesting was part of the supplementary information on the manuscript, and the same was held true. Um, the same disease categories were associated with once daily feeding when the feeding strategies were looked at as a four-level ordinal approach, once daily, twice daily, three times daily, free fed. And there was a relatively, a relatively interesting trend towards a titration effect the lowest risk for these categories of disease with once daily, the highest risk associated with three times daily, but free feeding did not follow that pattern. And again, I think that the research question that's inspired here is next to look at the total calories that are going into the dog in these different feeding strategies. If you think of free feeding as a dog who grazes throughout the day, one might expect it to look more similar to multiple meals feeding. If you think of free feeding as a dog who eats a lot when he's hungry and then doesn't eat for a long time, then it might not be surprising that it reflects some of the patterns seen for once daily feeding. Another component of the interaction that we have with our participants, I mentioned the end-of-life survey. So one of the challenges with the dog as a model for longevity research is elective euthanasia. Elective euthanasia obviously truncates numeric lifespan at a certain point, and in, in the US is a very common manner of death. So our approach with end-of-life survey is to, to distinguish euthanasia as the manner of death distinct from the owner's perceived cause of death. And as practitioners, we know that this is common, that an owner would say, my dog died, what happened? He had cancer. But in fact, a euthanasia decision was made for that dog. And so from the owner's perspective, we ask the cause of death from their perspective, the reason for euthanasia at the time that they made that choice, and the dog's quality of life, as well as the presence of medical symptoms or old age characteristics from their perspective. So shown here, Dr. Lizzie Pearson, who's currently at Texas A&M, 
um, with the Dog Aging Project. Dr. Kelly McNulty, who did a fellowship year with us and is now completing an internal medicine residency, had the first two publications out of the EOLS data. First, we had the, the first two months of responses when we launched this instrument. We had 646 responses in a convenient sample, and we also did a verbal interview with a number of those participants to mm -hmm. confirm that the data we were capturing in this survey was the same as what they would report in an unstructured verbal conversation to validate the survey. And then the second one is a 2021 curated data release, which included 33,000 dogs in that data release year. 2570 of whom we had EOLS completed. So first, we, did, we showed that in our pack, euthanasia was the manner of death for the majority of the dogs by far. So 83% in that convenient sample of the first two months experienced euthanasia as compared to unassisted death, and 85% in that first year um, experienced euthanasia rather than unassisted death. When owners are asked to report the cause of death, you'll note that a number of them report illness or disease, which is subcategorized here. And the next biggest category is old age. And again, we know that this is true when owners elect euthanasia. That is something that they commonly say. But what hasn't existed prior to this was a good way to describe what are they talking about. So this is the list of old age characteristics that we ask them to report and they're instructed to say all that apply to their dog. So we're going to be able to better describe what is meant by old age from an owner's perspective, particularly when it leads to a euthanasia decision and then is seen as the cause of death. Quite obviously, there's a lot going on there biologically and teasing it apart when the dog is living its elder years at home and when owners can choose euthanasia for any of a variety of reasons, absolutely requires a community science approach. We must ask the owner. So if we look at those 2,500 dogs in the first full year of data release from EOLS, again, illness or disease was the top categorical cause of death from the owner's perspective, followed closely by, again, old age. If we look at about 2,200 of those dogs who were euthanized and asked the owners, what was the main reason for euthanasia? And again, this gets to the experience we have as clinicians. Someone might have a dog with cancer whom they euthanize, and they euthanize the dog because it had cancer. But what about the cancer led to that decision? Did the dog have a poor quality of life right now? Many people chose poor quality of life. Did the dog have pain or suffering perceived right now? Many of the people chose pain or suffering? Or is it the case that the dog is actually well right now, but the owner anticipates poor quality of life or pain or suffering are coming, and so that is a decision that's made because of a prognosis? Teasing apart this reason for euthanasia, which might be different for dogs who have the same diagnosis, is an important part of understanding health span, which is potentially the more powerful target than lifespan, in dogs when euthanasia is available to truncate overt lifespan. Not surprisingly, the reasons for euthanasia were somewhat associated with the cause of death from the owner's perspective. So looking here, you're, you're seeing some of the most common reasons for euthanasia with the other group containing the least commonly chosen reasons. So poor quality of life, pain and suffering, and poor prognosis. And within each cluster of uh, reason for euthanasia groupings, you're seeing the cause of death from the owner's perspective. So among dogs whose reason for euthanasia was poor quality of life, the leading cause of death from the owner's perspective was old age, whereas among dogs whose reason for euthanasia was pain or suffering or poor prognosis, more dogs had illness and disease as their cause of death from the owner perspective not old age by itself. So not surprisingly, these two axes are a little bit intermingled and entangled, but by asking the question separately, we hope to gain a better understanding. The other thing that happens if you look at a multivariate analysis of the same data is that numeric age itself drops out. And so if you look at owner-reported cause of death and owner-reported quality of life, as predictors of whether euthanasia was performed or the dog died an unassisted death, numeric age falls right on the cutoff line. Numeric age does not seem to be a primary driver of the choice to euthanize, but it's the associated factors accompanying that age that lead owners to make that choice. 
Briefly, I'm going to share a couple of other ongoing investigations not yet published, our development of a tool to assess frailty and also to assess multimorbidity. So frailty is obvious but elusive to those of us in practice. We know it when we see it, but it's hard to describe. And it is that age-associated functional decline that is the loss of physiologic reserves and the loss of resilience to stressors. Frailty in people is strongly predictive of adverse outcomes, including death, but also including dependence on care, disability, and the acquisition of additional illness. In human medicine, there are numerous assessment tools that look at this from a variety of perspectives. In veterinary medicine, some tools are emerging. One of the challenges with frailty from the human perspective is that some of those tools include a lot of medical or diagnostic data. For our community science design to be widely applicable, we wanted to minimize reliance on diagnostic testing and emphasize the phenotype of frailty with externally observable features. Um, and so this is our proposed frailty instrument. We are currently collecting all of those features of this instrument from our dogs. We have not yet compiled it into an instrument that we can measure, um, but we will be able to do that as dogs reach the endpoint of mortality. And Dr. Melvin here has um, this paper with Dr. Olby, who is also in the audience today, um, under revisions right now, describing our instrument. As part of this, we are looking at a proxy for human gait speed by encouraging dogs to jog as quickly as they're willing down a 10 meter track, and then a proxy for strength by having them run up the stairs. And we have shown in some pilot data that those are associated with aging. Dogs get slower in both activities as they age. Um, what is surprising to me is that we are looking at unintentional weight loss as one of the parameters of our frailty instrument. And these are pilot data from our first 10,000 dogs on whom we have two sequential weights at the time of enrollment and a year later. And I was surprised to see that dogs, on average, have a trend towards weight loss with age. We tend to think of dogs as becoming less active and maybe getting a little bit heavier, maybe like has happened to some of us. And yet, if you look at this large population, there is some degree of weight loss that's occurring. So we're optimistic that this will be something we can document as unintentional weight loss through both the veterinary medical record and an instrument that owners use at home. Finally, looking at multimorbidity, this is simply the coexistence of two or more chronic diseases that again predicts mortality, the onset of additional diagnoses, and poor quality of life in people. And again, many scoring instruments exist in people, ranging from a simple tally of all diagnoses to a tally of certain diagnoses to a weighted scoring system derived from the proportional risk of each diagnosis. And we are proposing to use that chronic diagnosis inventory that I mentioned, 16 specific diagnoses asked of the primary care veterinarian for each of our dogs. Initially, we will look at a simple count of whether each diagnosis is present or absent, and subsequently we'll investigate whether waiting given diagnoses is a better way to predict mortality risk. Pilot data, this is another collaborator, Jessica Hoffman, who's at Augusta University. Shown here is data from the veterinary medical database looking at the mean morbidity count in dogs based on age groupings at the time of death. And these are related data from the vet compass data set. These are dogs who were just seen in their practice for a given exam and their mean morbidity count at, a, at various ages. You can already see the difference between the veterinary medical database, which is a veterinary teaching hospital derived database, the sickest of the sick, the weirdest of the weird, and the vet compass database, which is a general practice database. The dogs in the VMDB have more morbidities earlier than the dogs in the general practice data set. We do not yet have the chronic diagnosis inventory completed for enough of our dogs to analyze the results, but we were able to take the health and life experience survey completed by the owners, and assuming that they are as accurate as a veterinarian in reporting those diagnoses, we are able to project that the higher the morbidity count, the greater the likelihood of mortality over a two-year period of time. So again, this is a large group of dogs using owner-reported data, and we have every reason to imagine that the increased precision available in the veterinary-reported data will show similar trends over time. So 
I hope that I have shared with you who we are and what we do, and I hope that I have engaged you to be interested in our data. Our team is looking at these four things as our primary interests, the detailed clinical phenotype of the aging dog, which is of greatest interest to me as a practitioner, genetic associations, molecular mechanisms, and multi-omics, <clears throat> excuse me, and the triad clinical trial, and I invite you to insert your research interest here and use our data to answer your questions. Learn more about the project, including finding the way to access our data, sharing a few references, and my acknowledgments. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to talk with anyone in the meeting.